Mike, I know you've done this many times over during your career, you know, talk about your background and all that, and I, I think it would be an appropriate place for us to start here. Even though some of those listening have been fans of yours a long time and may know something about your life, there are always new people entering bodybuilding, and I'm sure they would like to know something of your past, anything you consider relevant or important. You're right, Dave, about people entering this field all the time. As a phone consultant, I receive calls from individuals literally every day who only recently picked up a barbell for the first time, and which augurs well for the future of this industry, by the way. These novitiates usually know little or nothing about mine or the sport's past, and since my life is so intimately bound up in bodybuilding, relating my past may teach them something about the recent and not so recent history of the sport. Dave, I was born on November 15, 1951, in Germantown, a small town outside of Philadelphia. At the age of two, my family moved to another small town in Pennsylvania, Ephra, which was and is predominantly a farming community. My dad was the major influence during the first 12 years of my life. Although he wasn't intellectually oriented himself, he went to some lengths to inculcate in me the values of education and knowledge. When I did do well in school, for instance, he would reward me. There was one occasion when I received all A's in my report card, and he gave me a baseball mitt, and another one when he gave me a $20 bill. He started me out correctly, as now I am a proud and successful capitalist, except for the very beginning, the first day of kindergarten, when I, I locked my mother out of the house to prevent her from entering me into school at all. I did rather well. Uh, you locked your mother out of the house? Yes, Dave. I was a very shy child for a number of years. I spent much of my time alone at home, rather introverted, not accustomed to being around other children. So upon learning I had to go sit in a classroom all day with others my age, I rebelled. I'll never forget as my mother walked out the door holding my hand to take me up the street to the first day of kindergarten, I all of a sudden bolted back inside and locked the door. It never occurred to me that she'd have a key, but my next remembrance of that day was my mother walking into the classroom where all the children were seated, carrying me wailing under her arm. <laughs> so your rebelliousness has a long history. My rebelliousness? What do you mean by that, Mr. Prokop? <laughs> well, I must say, Mike, a good part of your career seems to have revolved around questioning tradition, the establishment, and what so many merely blindly accept. Yes, Dave, that's true. In fact, the first ad I ever ran in 1977 to sell my books, I advertised myself in bold print as bodybuilding's foremost iconoclast. Iconoclast means literally image breaker, while every other top bodybuilder uncritically, unquestioningly accepted the Wheat or Schwarzenegger dogma, which had and still has individuals training up to four hours a day, I, upon hearing the truth as told by one Arthur Jones, discarded that junk immediately, and I've never sacrificed my view of the truth. Yes, Dave, I was a rebel, am a rebel, and always will be, albeit no longer blindly rebellious, as I was often in my youth. No, not a blind rebel. I now consider myself a radical for the truth. And if my telling the truth makes certain people angry, that's their problem. The truth is everyone's ally, whether each recognizes it or not. And if the truth hurts anyone, that individual is at odds with reality and is philosophically, psychologically in a bad place. I decided some time ago that I am not on this earth to win a damn popularity contest. Let me note here again that my father was a major influence, Dave. It was from him that I learned something valuable about integrity early on. My father, Harry Menser, who is now deceased, was someone who always seemed to find it easy to stand up for what he believed in. He reveled in it at times, boasting about his integrity, which had a way of irritating those of a weak-willed ilk. I responded rather heartily to my father's pride and self-esteem, which in part is why I am a staunch individualist today. I can remember people in my youth referring to the Mensers in a tone that inferred we were arrogant and conceited, but we weren't. We were merely proud of ourselves. Mike, what about training in those early years? In addition to emphasizing the importance of education, my father placed a very high premium on being physically able and strong. This resulted in a rigorously athletic first 10 years of my life, Dave. I had a reputation around my hometown. For wherever I went, I would run, jump to touch signs overhead and leap fences literally all the time, especially jumping fences. There were times when I would jump fences seemingly almost all day long, looking for ever higher ones to challenge my ability, and I never missed, believe it or not. I had a remarkable leaping ability. 
I also swam very well, especially the freestyle, in which event I beat the best fellow on the community swim team after receiving a special invitation to try out. I gave up swimming almost immediately, however, as they had us swim so many laps in practice I simply couldn't believe it. I truly was overwhelmed by the amount of work they expected. And looking back, I see that the coaches were grossly overtraining their athletes, as most trainers and coaches do today, all operating on the overly simplistic, childlike notion that more is better. I also did well in track and field, football, gymnastics, and baseball. But as soon as I discovered weight training at the age of 11, I gave up all other sports straight away. My early interest in weights extended beyond bodybuilding to Olympic lifting and powerlifting. My hometown, including the entire state of Pennsylvania, was influenced highly by the fact that the father of American weightlifting, Bob Huffman, operated out of York, which is only 30 miles from Ephrata. As a young teenager, a friend of my father's, Johnny Myers, who was a powerlifter, would take me on frequent visits to Musseltown, as York was called, to watch the nation's and world's best Olympic lifters, powerlifters, and bodybuilders train. I got the opportunity to spend entire Saturday afternoons at the then famous York Barbell Club, watching men like Bill March, Tony Garcia, and the precocious Bob Benarski, our best ever heavyweight Olympic lifter, practice technique as well as challenge their personal best in the press, snatch, and clean and jerk. Also, Terry Todd and Ernie Puckett, the first official champs in organized powerlifting, train on the bench press, squat, and deadlift. This had an enormous impact on me as I took up these lifts, the press, snatch, clean, and jerk, bench press, squat, and deadlift early on. In fact, they were the foundation of my training, and by the time I was 15 years of age, I pressed around 250 pounds, squatted 500 pounds for two reps on a free bar. By the way, I also got to see and talk to John Grimmick on a number of occasions. It was Huffman and Grimmick, you may recall, who launched Muscular Development Magazine, which was and is my favorite, and now is the only one I write for exclusively, but is published by Steve Blackman out of Ronkonkoma, New York, who recently changed the format to All Natural and is now called All Natural Muscular Development. In the beginning, Dave, I trained as the manual which accompanied the barbell set my parents gave me as a Christmas present directed three times a week with about ten exercises or sets per workout. It wasn't until I became a muscle magazine fanatic that I gave up a reasonably sane approach and started training six days a week for up to three hours per session. And as I wasn't making progress doing that, I assumed I'd have to train four hours a day, but wasn't sure at that point it was worth it. As I was working 12-hour shifts in the Air Force, working a part-time job, trying to spend as much time as possible with my girlfriend, the thought of training four hours a day wasn't very appealing. Just as I was about to forsake my dream of ever becoming a bodybuilding champion, I met Casey Vieter, who introduced me to Arthur Jones, who introduced me to high-intensity training theory. During a one-hour phone call, Mr. Jones disabused me of the notion that I was an expert on the subject, merely because I had memorized all of the top champs routines out of muscle magazines. Well, Mike, tell us more about Arthur Jones. Yes, an interesting subject for me. He possesses an unmitigated passion for the mind, especially mathematical exactitude, the likes of which I haven't seen since, Dave. The first time he and I spoke, it was on the phone, but not a conversation, rather a lecture, and with a capital L. After a very terse, almost abrupt introduction, he launched into an impassioned disquisition on the subject of the fundamentals of anaerobic exercise physiology. I was stunned, not just about what he said, which was brilliant, but more so how he said it. Something like Dr. Leonard Peikoff's description of his first meeting with Ayn Rand in her living room while he was only 17 years of age, this man, Arthur Jones, was willing to spend considerable time explaining to a complete stranger in the clearest, most objectively precise manner, the essence of anaerobic exercise science. Dave, it seemed like the fate of the entire world hinged on his summoning every scintilla of cognitive energy, wringing every bit of intellectual clarity possible from himself. And the reason he did it, in addition to enjoying the experience of achieving that level of intellectual precision, was because I was sincere, an intelligent yet ignorant and sincere 20-year-old. And as Dr. Peikoff also said about Ayn Rand, that he never expected to meet another individual again with the likes of her intellectual passion, 
I suspect I'll never meet anyone quite like Arthur Jones again. Hmm, that is one of the most insightful stories I've ever heard, both about Mike Menser and about Arthur Jones. Certainly unique. Well, Mike, thanks for sharing that. But now, what about Steve Blackman? I know that you were a writer for Joe Weider for 20 years. In fact, we worked together at one point in the Weider office in Woodland Hills, as you recall. What happened? After 20 years, all of a sudden, you're off and working for Steve Blackman. I originally moved, Dave, to Southern California 20 years ago at Weider's invitation to write for his magazine, Muscle Builder, which now, of course, is Muscle and Fitness. The first few years, Joe and I got along extremely well. Not only did we work well together during that period, we socialized quite a bit, and as many who were there recall, he seemed to regard me almost as a son, believe it or not. Joe had a certain love for philosophy as I did, so he finally had a top bodybuilder he could promote, who he could also talk to on a higher level, and promote me he did, Dave. There were as many as four and five of my articles appearing in each issue of Muscle Builder. I was appearing in his ads and was on the cover regularly. Then, in the aftermath of the 1980 Mr. Olympia, I vociferously protested in magazines and at my seminars that the contest was fixed for Arnold to win. This enraged Ben Weider, who talked about it to Joe, and apparently Ben's wrath rubbed off on his brother, and he eventually turned against me. Without belaboring it, Dave, our relationship, that is, Joe's and I's, hasn't been the same since. I perceived a further cooling off of Joe toward me several years ago, after Dorian Yates won his first Mr. Olympia, in fact. Dorian was very gracious at the time to cite me as his idol and even credited heavy-duty, high-intensity training for building his physique. This was the first Mr. Olympia that Mr. Weider couldn't claim he had trained. At about the time that Dorian had burst onto the scene, I was reaching a creative pinnacle, and my articles in Flex magazine were received, with Dorian giving me credit and Heavy Duty receiving ever greater recognition and acceptance, I believe Joe thought that he had created a monster, a threat to his concept as trainer of champs. But to his credit, Joe still allowed me to write for him. Mike, haven't you trained a few other top bodybuilders? Yes, including Aaron Baker, David Durth, Roland Kickinger, and David Paul, the barbarian of movie fame. Well, how did they do under your guidance? Extremely well, in fact, Dave. I got Aaron Baker interested after that first WBF contest, where he appeared in the worst condition of his life, having lost 25 pounds of muscle due to chronic gross overtraining. He was following something called the Bulgarian system, which had him training for up to one hour three times a day. Very disheartened, he approached me one day and I explained the heavy-duty system. He signed up immediately, and within six weeks had regained all the muscle he'd lost plus some, going to an all-time high muscular body weight of 254 pounds, I believe it was. Aaron made progress, Dave, literally every workout for months and months, which aroused the very intense interest of his good friend David Durth. David embraced heavy duty even more than Aaron, as he loved to train hard, whereas Aaron didn't. David made the best progress of his life, as this was when he put on considerable muscle mass and finally lost the image he had as the scrawny pro. David Paul was perhaps my favorite client ever, as he trained harder than anyone I've ever seen, including myself. David pushed every set so hard, one had the distinct impression he didn't care, literally, if he had pulverized his bones. He approached me a while back, complaining he hadn't gained any strength or muscle in five years while training for two hours a day, six days a week, sometimes twice a day. I kidded him, saying, David, it took you five years to figure out something was wrong, which is a good point to reiterate for the listener, a point I discussed on tape one. If your current program hasn't been yielding results for weeks or months, it's not going to start working magically next week. Cease immediately, take a two or three week layoff, and then resume training with high intensity. David Paul, by the way, put 185 pounds on his squat in four weeks, and gained seven pounds of muscle that month. Hmm, hmm, that's wonderful progress. And what about Dorian Yates? Dorian is almost a teratological case, Dave, an ultra-gargantuan physique who, like Victor Richards, is so imposing that when he walks into Gold's Gym in Venice, the other bodybuilders, even advanced ones, grit their teeth. They simply can't believe that anyone can attain that much sheer muscle mass. The first time I trained Dorian was in 1992, I ran into him at Gold's Gym, 
where he told me he was not satisfied with his progress. He had allowed the number of sets he was performing for each body part to creep up to six. Although he was reluctant to accept my conclusion that he was overtraining, he did allow me to supervise his bicep workout that day. The bicep workout consisted of one set of nautilus curls carried to a point of momentary muscular failure, whereupon I helped him into the contracted position and had him hold it there statically for roughly 15 seconds before lowering under strict control. Dorian didn't say much other than he liked the way it felt and with that left the gym. Thinking the matter was closed, I was surprised to see Dorian the next morning at Gold's eagerly seeking me out. Mikey said, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now, but I swear, I woke up this morning and my biceps were bigger from that one set yesterday. And with that, Dave, we, Dorian and I, agreed that I'd train him for the next two weeks so he could learn the one set system and use it when he returned home to England to prepare for the 1993 Mr. Olympia. I trained him on a couple of different occasions after that, but lately he's made it a point to steer clear of me. I suspect he didn't like all the publicity associating him with Mike Mincer. As a multi-Mr. Olympia winner, he is looking to create his own mythology, if you will, and possibly because he found out that it wasn't politically correct to be lauding me in flex and muscle and fitness. Hmm, that's too bad. Well, in a way, perhaps, Dave, but remember, Dorian is his own man and must do what he regards as best for his career. He had been so kind as to endorse my heavy-duty system in my magazine ads, which has helped the cause, and I sure do appreciate it. To pick up the thread, Mike, where does Steve Blackman enter the picture? At the right time. In the early part of 1995, in fact, when I was really starting to grow uncomfortable with the strain between Joe Weider and myself, certain individuals who had contact with Mr. Blackman began reporting to me that he was interested in having me work for him. I had never heard of the man before and would reply to these people, look, if Mr. Blackman is interested in having me work for him, why doesn't he call me? And lo and behold, it wasn't long after that that I received a phone call. And I'm glad he did call, for we hit it off very well from the outset, and I have no regrets about leaving Weeder and signing to work exclusively for Steve and the best magazine on the market, namely All Natural Muscular Development. Mike, I'm glad to hear you and he are getting along so well. Yes, he is an interesting, intelligent, as well as a very decent man, Dave. During the first few of those phone calls last year, we each recognized our strong mutuality of values. In addition to being about the same age, both of us have had a lifelong love of bodybuilding, enormous respect for the intellect and science, and a strong desire to advance the bodybuilding industry's future. In fact, Steve sees himself as the man to possibly direct or redirect the future of this sport or industry. He possesses a restless intelligence and exacting standards that demand ever more complex challenges. He also has enormous resources, including time. At the age of 43, Mr. Blackman is imbued with the cardinal element of youth. He knows that great things are possible and has the audacity to achieve them. And with regard to the Blackman Brothers Twin Lab Supplement Company, I decided to endorse their Creatine Fuel Plus because it, like the rest of their supplements, is the best on the market. Last year, in 1996, I visited Steve and his brothers at the Twin Lab facility in Ronkonkoma, New York. While I was prepared, Dave, not to be unduly impressed, as I had heard reports from a few others, including John Romano, as to how great an operation Twin Lab truly is, I was still very, very impressed. As Ross Blackman started me on the Cook's tour of the factory and warehouse, I couldn't help but notice the great pride he had in regard to their achievement. And by the time we were halfway through, I saw that his pride was certainly justified. The warehouse is enormous, packed with material and product, from the floor to the top of the 35-foot ceiling, much of it on conveyor belts, which keep everything moving all the time so there is never more than two days storage, and thus that the buyer receives fresh quality product, which is their forte. They have so many fail-safe backup systems at every step along the production line to ensure quality. With Twin Lab, you can be certain you're getting what you pay for, as opposed to others in the bodybuilding supplement industry who farm out their products to be produced by others. I see you've been endorsing Twin Lab's Creatine Fuel Plus. Now, Mike, do you really use it? Not only do I actually use it, Dave, I practically live on it at times. 
As busy as I am, there are periods when I don't have time for formal sit-down meals, especially breakfast and lunch. So I drink Creatine Fuel Plus along with Twin Labs Egg Fuel mixed in non-fat milk periodically through the day, but always have a normal dinner. More recently, I added Twin Labs Sport Fuel Multivitamin Mineral Supplement for the powerful antioxidant properties which help prevent muscle catabolism during high-intensity training. And I've never felt better. Mike, there was an interesting comment in one of your recent articles in All Natural Muscular Development. You stated that you've mastered bodybuilding science. To be precise, Dave, I stated that in looking back to when I wrote Heavy Duty 1 four years ago, I realized that my level of understanding of the fundamental theoretical principles of bodybuilding science was something on the order of 2 plus 2 equals 3 and a half. As a result, my client's progress wasn't as good as it could have been. Now my understanding is the equivalent of 2 plus 2 equals 4. And that shows up in my clients finally achieving results I always knew were possible. Before, I would only occasionally have someone gain 10 to 20 pounds in a month or 30 to 40 pounds in 3 to 5 months. Now such gains are the rule. When I mention the fact that I have finally mastered the fundamentals of bodybuilding science to someone on the phone recently, he said, there you go again, posturing men, sir, always so damn certain. How can you possibly claim such a thing? And I responded, didn't you, sir, master the fundamentals of mathematical science, namely addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division? I didn't say, I continued, that I'm omniscient or infallible, or even that I possess an exhaustive knowledge of exercise science. Give me a break, I continued. I'm a little slow. It took me over 20 years to master the simple fundamentals of bodybuilding science, and which may be summarized like this. To be productive, exercise must be number one, intense, number two, brief, and number three, infrequent. The fundamentals, in other words, relate to the issues of intensity, volume, and frequency. Now, in stating that I've mastered the fundamentals of bodybuilding science, listener, I can't say necessarily that I would start you or a new client on the same baseline program that the Almighty would, as mentioned on a previous tape, what I do is start the individual on a proven baseline program, one that has worked well for the majority, if after checking his strength increases, once he has completed two or three cycles of the four workouts, I deem his progress is not satisfactory, I make modifications. An important observation I made several years ago, having been a trainer for two years at that point, is that those with what I refer to as linear physiques, those with slider builds, most often individuals 5 foot 10 or taller and 150 to 185 pounds or so, are the ones who usually do not tolerate high intensity exercise stress quite as well as others. And with those of that body type whose training history already clearly reveals a lower exercise stress tolerance, I start them out on a modified program which I refer to as the consolidation program. I understand, Mike, that your new book, Heavy Duty 2, Mind and Body, which is filled with quotes, has a quote from Thomas Jefferson as the first quote of the book. Yes, and it is perhaps President Jefferson's most famous. He said, Fix reason firmly in her seat, and call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion. Question with boldness even the existence of a God, because if there is one, he must more approve of the homage of reason than that of blindfolded fear." Close quote. If anyone listening thinks that the material on these tapes is too intellectual, Dave, that perhaps people shouldn't be expected to learn philosophy, remember, bodybuilding does not exist in a vacuum apart from the rest of life. Even within bodybuilding, if one desires to learn to distinguish between true and false ideas, he must learn to reason, and only a rational philosophy can teach that. This is the end of side one. Please turn over the tape at this point to continue with side two.